chapter 13, verse 31. Let me pray. <coughs> Excuse me. Lord, I just thank you for this time that we have with you, Lord. Um, Lord, as we study this upper room discourse, Lord, let this be an intimate time that we have with you, that you would show us uh, your way, you would show us your servitude, Lord, and that you would mold our hearts and mend our hearts to be more like you. Lord, uh, we can't do it on our own. But Lord, we may try and try and try to uh, act a certain way, be a certain way, Lord, but we realize that it's you that changes hearts. And Lord, we just thank you for that. And we ask you to come and change hearts and open eyes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I was going to read the rest of the chapter, but I got so wound up in these verses uh, 31 and 35 where Jesus says, um, here a new commandment I give to you. And uh, I just, there's just so much there that we, we won't get into Peter saying, Peter's going to say, uh, I won't deny you. And that's coming up. That's coming up. And, and God willing, next week. Um, but this week, we're on verse 31. But let me set the stage before I read this. Do you remember what's happening here? I mean, those of that, that have been here, um, those that haven't, it's right here in your text. What, 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 what's going on is they're in the upper room. And he just tells them that there's a betrayer amongst our midst and obviously we know it's Judas and as Judas walks out the door this is when this begins right here so there's 11 left with him up in the upper room so Judas walks out the door and we begin right here it says so when he had gone out Jesus said now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So here, Judas is gone. The, uh, the 11 are in the room and he's talking to them. And this is our last... John, we're only in John chapter 13. And there's... How, how many chapters is there in John? There's... There are several pages left in John, and it's going to go all the way through, uh, what is it, 21, yeah. I know there's at least 17, because the 17th is one of my favorite chapters. But there's 21 chapters in John, so within the next several chapters, there's a lot happening in a short span of time. John spends most of his gospel talking about this, this last day, these last couple days. Uh, that, that's going on here verse 31 says now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him tonight today I'm gonna I'm gonna try to paint to you a picture of his glory but let me ask you something if you got somebody that has been blind from birth and you try to describe what light looks like how hard is that to do? Think of it. How would you describe light to somebody that's never seen light? Tough. I mean, you can use all the words, uh, and that's what I'm getting at. I'm going to use some words today, but I can't really describe how glorious Christ is with just words. It comes by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he uh, know them because they are spiritually discerned. 
Right now, in the upper room, think of what's going on. There's 11 left, and they are true disciples and apostles of Jesus Christ. They understand as much as they need to at this point of what Jesus is saying. And they're going to be, they're going to look back at this and they're going to say, wow, that's his glory. You see? Well, I was looking at this. How do you describe light? I mean, if you went to somebody that was blind, it's never seen the sunset and you're trying to describe it. Here, here's what you could say. You could say there's something that uh, light is something that makes vision possible. Well, you're like, well, I'm blind. How can I? I want that light. I want to be able to see. And it it also, here's the definition of light. The sensation aroused by stimulation of the visual receptors. That's what, okay, there's a a sunset, and it's this this stimulation of your visual receptors. That's how you describe light, right? No, that's not going to work for somebody who's never seen light. Uh, Okay, here's, here's one you could tell them. You could say it's electromagnetic electromagnetic radiation of any wavelength that travels in a vacuum with the speed of about 186,281 miles or 300,000 kilometers per second, specifically such radiation that is visible to the human eye. Well, it's not visible to my eyes. So you think about trying to describe the glory of Christ to somebody that can't see it. It's really tough, really tough to do. It has to be done by God. So now, there are four things I want to cover today. Who is He when we speak of the glory of Christ? Who is He? What He accomplished? How He accomplished it? And why He accomplished it? And we're going to spend a lot of time on the why He accomplished it today. Okay, number one, who is He? He's about to reveal who He is. The other day, we were watching a movie. Actually, the girls were watching a movie. I was kind of watching it too, but I had some things to do, so I didn't get to stay and watch it all. It was called The Roman Holiday. By uh, It was Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn. It was an old movie. And she's a princess in Rome. And, and she's in the castle and she wants to leave the castle and be amongst the people. So what she do? She left the castle and went down amongst the people. I didn't watch much more than that. But we know a lot of TV or movie stories where the king or queen or prince, prince and a pauper, leave the castle and come down amongst the people. Um, Leviticus 12 or 26, 12 says, I will walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. So, it's one thing to leave Buckingham Palace and go amongst the people. It's another thing to leave the highest throne of all thrones and to be born in the lowest position ever in a manger, in a barn, right? You're born in a barn because there's no room at the end. And you come to this earth. I mean, and I said this a couple weeks ago. We cannot fathom how high he is and how far. We, we know the low because we live here, okay? We know that portion. But how, how far, how high was he when he came low to be with us? And he, and he, and he walked among us. Philippians 2 7 says, But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. And coming in the likeness of man. Not only, he didn't come down to be the king. He came down as a bond servant to serve. His gospel say that he came as a servant. He is the king, but a servant king. You see, he came to serve us. Uh, Well, you think of this. If I... I can't have fellowship with, uh, what's her name, Queen Elizabeth? I think that's, is she still around? <laughs> Anyways, I, I can't have fellowship with her because um, there's just a, a social and culture gap, okay? <laughs> it's pretty big. But <laughs> I can't have fellowship with her, and she probably wouldn't want to have fellowship with me. 
Uh, you know, she's not sitting on her chair saying, I wonder what Brian Walker's doing today. She's not doing it, I guarantee it, right? But look at the fellowship we have with God, and how do we have fellowship with God? Look how much higher he is than Queen Elizabeth. The reason why we can have fellowship with God is because he came down to us. And it's through the mediator, Jesus Christ, that we can have fellowship with such a holy God. So how, you know, that's very important, is how he did it. Now, what he accomplished. I mean, and, and, and let me tell you, I could go on and on and on and on. This would be a really long sermon if I covered every point of his glory. You can't do it. and I don't think you can do it in a lifetime. His glory. Number two, what he accomplished. The word says that he took our sin. First Peter says two first Peter chapter two verse twenty four says Who himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree, that having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. It says that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. So number one, he took our sin upon himself. And number two, he gave his righteousness upon us. If, if he just took our sin, that leaves us with nothing. So he took our sin upon himself and he gave us his righteousness. You can find that in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians and Romans. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So not only did he take away our sin, but he replaced it with his righteousness. That God can look upon us and see righteousness. So we receive the righteousness. Now how do we do this? We, we receive it through faith. Romans chapter 3, verse 22 and 24 says this, Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen, fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we receive this righteousness of God. And how do we do it? We receive it through faith. What is the object of our faith? Jesus Christ. And I looked for that slide that we, we went over Wednesday. I couldn't find it. You know that, that website, it says broken. I'll have to get with you later to find out where his notes are at. But his notes on Wednesday were talking about of saving faith. And it says that our, our faith is not the object of our salvation. You, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's just we have to have belief in Christ. We have to have belief in, belief in Him. And it says here, His grace. What well, is grace? Grace is a gift. It's not earned. We, we can't earn our grace. We can't earn grace. Now, third. How did He accomplish it? Well, he was sinless, wasn't he? He, was, he didn't sin. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, I have another witness that he was sinless, or that he was a good person. You know who said that he was good? That you wouldn't expect to say he was good? The criminal on the cross next to him. The criminal, there was one criminal on one side started telling him, hey, if you're, if you're who you say you are, then get us off of here, right? And the other one, he says this, he says, and if indeed, indeed justly, for we received a due reward. See, he said, we're, we're receiving our due reward. We're being crucified up here. This is what we deserve. But then he says, this man has done nothing wrong. The criminal on the cross next to him even admitted that he did nothing wrong. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. He says, for this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. 
who committed no sin, nor was uh, decent deceit found in his mouth. You remember Pilate? Pilate says, I, I find no fault in this man. And he said, I wash my hands of this thing. The centurion, remember when he passed, when he died? The, the veil was rent. There was an earthquake. And the centurion said, truly this is the Son of God. So we have witness upon witness that he was sinless and he was the Son of God that he came. I believe that when he says now that his glory is going to be revealed, it's like that, that prince in a pauper, that, that one that's amongst the people, the, the king of kings, lord of lords of all the earth, that is down amongst the people. And now he's revealed as God here on earth. Now, I think about it today, holiness. We, we've got to be careful as a church. Holiness is important for us, our men and women in the church. Uh, purity, holiness, this is really important. This was esteemed by Christians of the day. Do we have men of God in our church? We need to have men of God in our church, women of God, that strive towards holiness. And that's not accomplished by the flesh. That's accomplished through His Spirit. You can try and try and try. It's not going to happen. It's God that empowers us to do these things, okay? Now, you think of today, if somebody's doing something wrong, what do they try to do? They try to get you in on it. <laughs> that always happens. Somebody's doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And they're like, hey, come here. Check this out. Why do people do that? Because they don't want to be miserable in their sin by themselves. They want to try to bring everybody down so they don't look so bad. You remember the peer pressure in high school? Hey, you got to do this or you got to do that. Or your friends that are out on the street. Hey, or ex-friends. Hey, come here, try this. They want you to be like them. We need to strive to be holy and different. Like, like we were saying, we're, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And there's nothing wrong with that, guys. As a matter of fact, that, that's almost become a bad thing. No, we have to strive for holiness. We have to strive for that, he, that sinlessness that Christ had. Not, we're never going to achieve what He achieved through the flesh or any of that. It's only through His righteousness that we have a leg to stand on. But we still have to commit to that. Um, but do we desire to be around those people that are saying, hey, come here, try this? We shouldn't. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, it says, He who walks with the wise man will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. I remember when I was shooting archery. If I shot with somebody, I used to shoot competition. And I shot with some pros once, where they, different times where they'd come through on a tour. And my score went way up. And I'm sure it's the same with golf, baseball, whatever kind of sport it is. If you play with a professional, your, your level of playing is going to go up. But also, other, if, if, you, if you're in a group, you're going to go down to that level of that group. And you, you just need to distance yourself from that. Now, in these set of verses here, in, in, we'll get back to... Uh, John chapter 13, number 4, why did he accomplish what he accomplished? And this is one I want to spend most of the time on today. I know the time's slipping. But why did he do what he did? He did it for love. He did it for love. And, and this is really important. Look here in the text. It says, he calls them little children. Jesus calls the disciples little children. They're not children in in, in Physical sense, they're in their 30s probably. But he calls them little children. It's a very affectionate term. It's only used once in the New Testament by Jesus 
once by Paul, and seven times, yeah, seven times by John in one God in one of his books, First John. And if you know your Bible, First John's a small book. You could probably read it in 10, 15 minutes, an hour from me. You know, you would probably read it in 10 to 15 minutes, an hour later, I'd get done with it. But it's a small book, and John uses that word seven times, little children. So why? Well, look what he says here. In verse 34, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Well, this isn't new in that sense. It is new in a way. So how is this new? Because in Leviticus it says that we should love one another. But it's new in a way that now our religion, being a Christian is defined by the love we have for one another. In the past it used to be who's circumcised or who's a Jew, who was born into this family. Now... You can be identified as a Christian for your love for one another. It has nothing to do with race, color, ethnic, anything like that. It doesn't matter what background you have. You can tell a Christian by his love for one another. And that wasn't the case. It was either you were born in and circumcised in, but now this is your love for one another. So he says here, as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You do not become a disciple because you have love for one another. You become, that's how people can recognize who you are. That's not the path to get there. The path is through Jesus Christ. But a fruit of being a disciple of Christ is that you show love for one another. And I got to tell you, I think this is why he picks me as a pastor. Because some people only need the 30, 45 minutes that I'm going to tell you today about this, right? If you're preaching this, you have to study for 8 to 12 hours on this subject. So I need it more than you. Okay? But, and you, you only have to hear it for 30 minutes. But I study it for several hours. And it's tough. What I looked at, it says, as I have loved you. So I pondered this. I says, Lord, I can't love the amount of love that you've given for me. How can I show that love, the amount of love for someone else? Because I can't match the love that he poured out on that cross for me. So I'm thinking about this and I'm saying, Lord, what do you mean by this? It's not the amount of love, it's the type of love. It's the servant love for one another. Now look, this is the way we think as people. We'll say, I'll love that person if they love me back. What do I get out of it? If they love me, then I'll love them. No. He said, you love one another as I have loved you. Without expecting a return. You see? And that was tough. That's tough. You have to love. You don't love because of what you get out of it. You love based on what he's done for you. Now, this is not a new concept. Here, here's the thing. We got this thing. You hear it today. It's called pay it forward. It's not a new concept. Jesus came up with this. He gave us love and servitude. And he says, I want you to go out and love one another like I've loved you. You're never going to pay him back. You can't pay him back for what he's done for you. Based on what he's done for you, the motivation that you have is to go love one another because he loved you. Not because, and I can't say this enough, it's not because 
of what you're going to get back out of that relationship. It's because of what he's done for you. That's where the, the motivation of this love comes from. Now, I want you, this one little section of scripture, I want John to explain the rest of it. So I've got a couple minutes left. I want you, if you have your Bibles or your phone or anything, I want you to open it to 1 John. And we're going we're gonna to do a jet tour through, the, through 1 John, which is right before Revelation. So, 1 John, we're going to read several verses out of 1 John. And this is his first letter. And remember I said in this 1 John, he uses the words... Little children, seven times, and that's the only time other than Paul's one time and this time that you'll see these little children seven times in the, in the New Testament. So I believe John is telling us what, it's mean, what it means to love one another here in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. Chapter 2, verse 5, it says, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. How do we know we are in him? Truly the love of God is perfected in him. If you keep his word. 2.15, 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. First John, that's why I don't have slides today. I want everybody to look for themselves. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Yeah. It says, Behold, what matter of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. What matter of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God? 1 John 3, chapter, or 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Do you want to know if you're of God? Do you have love for your brother? And we're talking, remember who, who's, who this is given to. These are the disciples in the upper room, his apostles, the eleven left. He's intimate. 3.11 says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 1 John 3.14 says, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. That's pretty sharp. Pretty sharp. 1 John 3.16. There's John 3.16 right there, huh? By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Remember Jesus said in John, he says, You love as I have loved you. Well, what did he do? He laid down his life for us. See, John's telling us what this means. 1 John 3.17 says, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brothers in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? How? 1 John 3.18, My little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and truth. 1 John 3.23, and this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. Chapter 4, verse 7 says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. This is how you know if you're born again. 1 John 4.8 says, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And they said, Corinthians chapter 13 is the love chapter. This book is love. 1 John 4, 9 says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, 
that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Chapter 4, verse 10. In this love, not that we love God, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Continuing, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. Verse, skip down to 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. 17, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. 19, we love him because he first loved us. 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? 21, and this commandment we have from him that, that he who loves God must love his brother also. In chapter 5, verse 2, this is, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Verse 3, For this is love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. That's what John had to say about that. I could have read the whole book. And I, know, I very rarely read that many scripture, but I wanted you to see how important love is. Love for each other. Take a look around. Love for each other. These people. Love for these people. Love for the people out there too. But specifically, love for each other. Okay? This is our family, guys. This is our family. This is the people that we will spend eternity with. And there are other people out besides us. What did Jesus do? He died for us. He said, love as I have loved you. Be willing to give your life for your brothers and sisters. Be willing to sacrifice, to get up off that couch and do something for somebody. Be willing, be loving and kind. And I can't stress this enough. And like I said, <laughs> I need this more than you because yeah, I studied it all week. Like I said, it's not what you get out of the love that you give. It's not what you get out of that. What your love comes from God that fills you up. And you're overflowing with love so you have to pass it on to someone else. That's how it works. So, who is he? He's the king of kings that walked around with us. He came down. That's how much love he had that he left up there and came down here. He took our sin. He gave us his righteousness. He was sinless. He did all this through suffering. And people say, well, I think we have a bad view of Christianity today. We think that Christianity is all roses and peaches and cream. There's some suffering that comes with it. He said, take up your cross and follow me. And why did he do it? Because he loved us. And we have to love each other the same. When, picture this, when Jesus is talking to them, he says, little children. He says, little children. When John's talking to his disciples, to his people, after Jesus is gone, he calls them little children. John is showing the love to them that Christ has shown to him. What if they don't reciprocate that love? It doesn't matter. He's got the love from God feeding him. There's always this relationship 
And we need, and this is where Jesus said, I am, I have come as a servant, not to be served. That's what we our heart needs to be is we're perpetuating love, not expecting it in return. Because how many people it's easy to say, if I love you, you'll love me. If I if I if I do this for you, you'll do that for me. Regardless of what comes back, we have to love. And that shows us who we are. Pray with me. Lord, I just thank you for this eye-opening uh, commandment that you give. Lord, that people were looking on us and they will say, they will know that we are yours by our love. Lord, I understand it. I just ask you to help us in this area. Help people understand what really love is, Lord. It's serving. Lord, it's not all mushy and all this stuff, Lord. Lord, sometimes it's correction. But it's serving each other. Lord, it say in your word that if we ask anything in your name, that you will give it. And Lord, I ask you to change our hearts and help us in this aspect to be more like you, to be more loving to me, to reciprocate what you give to us, to give to others. Lord, just help us with this as we go forward today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.